Hello, and welcome to the second edition of the Perennial Activity Series. My name is Nick Trevellini. I am a member of New School Policy and Design for Outer Space. And so I'm so happy and grateful to be able to host the series of events and to welcome our second speaker in the series, Edward P. Butler, um, who will be speaking on the subject of worshiping in the future and in outer space. Um, so a couple quick words. I want to thank City X Pavilion uh, as part of the Venice Architecture Biennale. They are the folks who are hosting this event and allowing us to participate in it. Uh, and so we're very grateful to, to them for allowing us to, to do that and for, for having us uh, participate. Uh, and again, thank you to, to Ed for, for participating and speaking with us today. Uh, and before I turn the microphone over to Ed, uh, let me say a few quick words of introduction. Uh, Edward Butler received his doctorate in philosophy from the New School for Social Research in 2004 uh, for his dissertation, The Metaphysics of Polytheism in Proclus. Since then, he's published regularly in academic journals and edited volumes, uh, primarily on Platonism, the polyistic uh, excuse me, polytheistic philosophy of religion and the theologies of several polytheistic traditions. From 2014 to 2019, he was a co-editor of Walking the World, a biannual journal of polytheism and spirit work, and presently serves on the advisory board of the journal Oscillations, non-standard experiments in anthropology, the social sciences, and cosmology. Highly encourage folks to check that uh, journal out. A practicing devotional polytheist for his entire adult life, he's an advocate for the preservation, restoration, and revival of the polytheistic traditions around the globe as the director of the Center for Global Polytheist and Indigenous Traditions at Indica since 2021. He's also recently joined the International Advisory Board of the International Commission for Human Rights and Religious Freedoms. Congratulations, Ed. Uh, more information about his work is available at his website, uh, kinodology.wordpress.com. And with that, Ed, thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you for speaking with us today. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the New School Policy and Design for Outer Space, the Venice Architecture Biennale, the City X Pavilion, and especially Nicholas Travellini for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my paper is titled Considerations Regarding Worship in Extraterrestrial Habitats. Experience of extraterrestrial environments, whether those associated with transiting the interplanetary medium or with long-term habitation of artificial satellites or of planetary habitats, will impart an intense and profound awareness of the finitude of resources and the necessity for survival of making the most of them. One such resource is orientation in supremely disorienting environments and the ability to experience belonging in the ultimate event of alienation, namely the removal from the planetary matrix from which the individual, or at least their kind, will have emerged. Success in this effort, however, may mean that the individual will come to see this emergence as no more estranging than birth itself. Unexplained phenomena, or events that may be mundane to others but spiritually significant to the individual, will rapidly begin to fill any space initially void of transcendent coordinates. Lore will be shared and webs of narrative will be spun. Cultural changes on Earth will have created a disposition to find ways to accommodate this dimension of experience. Psychological models will no longer privilege atheistic identity formations as though they represent optimal adjustment to reality. Moreover, the participants in space exploration will have proven in a multipolar world more diverse by far than the astronauts of the 20th century or the billionaire dilettantes of the early 21st century. By the time of which I'm speaking, China, India, the African Union, Brazil, and Mexico are all abundantly represented in activities of space exploration and settlement 
as are their indigenous religious traditions. This is the other part of the revolution that I am envisioning, namely the cosmopolitical revolution of thought, which will have been integral to Earth's finding its way through the troubled waters that made it seem to many in the early 21st century as though the odds were stacked against humans and the other beings sharing our fragile ecosystem. So many species were lost and so much damage done that a shadow of mourning passed across our world like the passing of some massive object through our emotional and cultural space and led over time to a revaluation of values. On the one hand, the voices of the non-human, whether animal, inanimate, or incorporeal, could no longer be devalued or for many ignored as elements of their personal world. Humans were drawn back despite themselves into the fabric of dialogue with other beings whose worlds differed incommensurably from their own. Contrary to the concerns of some in the early stages of this process, this cosmopolitical awakening did not result in the rejection of science or of political structures based on inalienable rights, but it did reconceptualize them. Science, for example, was no longer seen as providing the exclusive access to the truth, which integral worldviews veiled. That is, it was no longer seen as a hegemonic scientism, but rather as a set of practices thin enough in themselves to pass between what came to be recognized as discrete but permeable cosmotechnical regimes. This paradigm shift, or rather, the shift into a radical plurality of paradigms resulted in the human race, a young one by galactic standards, finally integrating its timeless wisdom, part of its basic organic toolkit for survival into its technological development. External observers have indeed noted that some such realignment is often required for worlds passing through the ecological bottleneck created by the uneven development of psychical capacities in ages of rapid technological acquisition. As a result, humanity and the Earth's other surviving sentient beings passed their most dire test. Humans, however, had been transformed. Waves of ecological trauma resulted in a conception of humanity which was no longer limited to the narrow taxonomic conception of the human that had fed anthropocentric delusions. Searing social conflicts as well resulted in a different experience of one of the previous world's most divisive phenomena, namely religion. An emergent, generally shared conviction recognized that religion was not a transitory phase in human life, and hence the differences among different religious traditions was not going to be superseded by the achievement of a new atheist plateau of enlightenment, nor by the victory of any one tradition over the others. But this wasn't all. The new humanity was spirit haunted or gods bothered as the saying goes. The new cognitive equilibrium that had made possible the very survival of life on Earth had forced the competing monologues of the younger religious traditions to adjust to something more like the inhuman dialogues characteristic of the formative era of the human species, radically pluralistic, polytheistic, experiential, ambiguous, and hermeneutical. Polytheism in particular which affirmed the radical truth of everyone's gods, not as mere manifestations of some underlying unity beyond them, but just as they were experienced by their devotees, proved a crucial element from humanity's past for its adaptation to the future, psychologically, intellectually, and culturally. None of the existing religious traditions emerged unchanged from this period of restless spiritual questioning and many new and revived traditions joined them. Some minority traditions experienced rapid growth 
Other large ones, sharp declines, usually in the form of schismatic internal differentiation. This is the social, historical, and religious context for the emergent protocols respecting worship in extraterrestrial environments and habitats that I wish to discuss. These recognized that worship was going to be radically plural and even idiosyncratic in character, and that it was going to penetrate every aspect of human life. It wasn't going to stay within any tightly defined parameters that left the lion's share sterilized of its presence. As a result, the perspective on how to accommodate the spiritual needs of humans in extraterrestrial habitats underwent a fundamental shift from being focused on representing a finite number of sects considered too important to ignore toward the development of a class of supremely pragmatic spirit workers adepts in more than one tradition, and experts above all in the recognition and treatment of states of spiritual crisis. This jack of all ritual trades, similar to the itinerant mantis of ancient Hellenism, forms of which were known in most indigenous traditions, came to form the backbone of worship in these environments. As a result of the circumstances I've been discussing, Considerations concerning worship in these exotic environments are necessarily less than specific. Religion in the era I am treating has become empirical once again, which is the only way in which it could guide us on these impossible journeys, as it did before in the very beginnings of human civilization. In those times as well, humans lived in tightly knit small groups facing environments which were either extreme as such, for example, during the Ice Age, or extreme in any event relative to the human's level of preparation. As humans, it seems, have always gone out into the world ahead of their proven capacities. We note as well the tendency for relationships with gods and spirits to be established under extreme circumstances whether external, such as a trek into the wilderness, or internal, as in the induction by pharmacological or other means of an effective crisis state in the human animal. The extraterrestrial environment, therefore, in light of historical experience, would be considered in general an encounter or discovery situation with respect to such entities. This is not to say that humans may not encounter gods and spirits familiar to them in these new environments, but to discover new aspects of their nature in such a situation is at any rate to be expected. Spirit workers, therefore, will require protocols for recognizing and dealing with such occurrences, which can be a gap in some traditions, which have perhaps for a long time been focused solely on the conservation and regulation of existing relationships with their divinities. Workers in these traditions may thus need to recover and counter protocols which are presently sedimented within their practice. A basic consideration of orientation is in the nature of the extraterrestrial habitat. Whether in an orbital environment, or in long-term space travel, or even in permanent settlement contexts on a planet that does not support unprotected human life. Though I wish to separate off as a special case that in which native life of whatever kind exists in such environments. In any of these cases, the human cannot be said to be in an ecosystem. Only the most complex and fully developed permanent habitats would even approach this state as a regulative ideal. The only true ecosystems in such environments rather is that which exists inside each living individual. In this respect, each soul is a planet bearing its life-giving habitat within it. As such, the fundamental orientation of the persons in such an environment is inward and this recognition must be central to all of the spirit workers' interventions. 
One of the consequences of this basic existential orientation for practical spirit work is that the structural relation between interior and exterior is fundamentally different than in terrestrial operations. The interior, in effect, becomes the exterior. One likely potential effect of this circumstance will be the pooling, so to speak, of dreams among inhabitants. The spirit worker will need to be prepared to manage this, to guide it without manipulation, but rather helping the gods to be heard through the turbulence of interpenetrating souls. This will also bear on ideas concerning divergent neural organizations. Notions such as sanity and insanity, by the time of which I am speaking, have been radically renegotiated already due to transformed social and cosmopolitical circumstances. What was for a time considered madness is now recognized as a resource requiring careful management, just as a precious substance may have to be extracted under volatile conditions. The spirit worker, fortunately, has been well-trained in such operations and sees the emergence of neurotic or psychotic symptoms in the extreme conditions of extraterrestrial habitation as an aspect of the encounter or discovery situation as dangerous to the individual, no doubt, as childbirth, but with the same degree of collective importance. The emergence of something akin to the song lines or dreaming tracks of the Australian indigenous traditions is the ultimate goal of the therapeutic process in such cases, and not merely the successful adjustment of the individual to the environment for that therapeutic paradigm would necessarily be misapplied in a context where the interior and exterior orientations have been essentially reversed, where the life-giving habitat lies within and not outside. There is no adjustment in the true sense to an environment which is inimical to life. Intersubjectivity in the extraterrestrial environment is accordingly among collectives not atomized subjects. The issue of individual autonomy in such a context will have to be a primary ethical problem. But what of circumstances in which there is non-human biological life in the environment, such as life native to a planet on which humans are establishing permanent settlement? In the first place, of course, a state of moral emergency exists in such a situation to the degree that human presence endangers an existing ecosystem. But what are the theological dimensions relevant to this situation? The spirit worker will have to consider first that there is in certain respects nowhere that is without life. Stars are massive living beings and even a planet barren of microbes bears spirit and hosts spirits in and through its geological and chemical processes. The void of space, too, which we must perhaps reconceptualize as the abyss of relativity, that is, the environment most nearly devoid of orientation, either bears such non-biological life as well by virtue of whatever processes are natural to it, unless it is instead to be considered the pure limit or absolute periphery of planetary or solar orientation, a problem of metaphysics which I cannot address in the present paper. Given these considerations, the establishment of alliance between human and non-human life presents itself as the all-important goal of existing in these environments, as the transcendent meaning or value or to use theological terms, the providence of the situation. This will emerge as a pronoetic condition or determination from pronoia or providence, as a moral and psychic externality, not as a mere ethical conjecture. In all likelihood, it will present itself forcefully as the teleological underpinning of life in these environments, which will have to be taken into account 
in recognizing the autonomy of extraterrestrial communities to seek whatever accommodations are necessary and which may in turn have major consequences for terrestrial planning. In essence, it may not be possible for those on the home world to determine in advance the telos of off-world communities who will have to seek reciprocal understanding with the powers in their environment in ways which it will be impossible for outsiders to preconceive, though this will not, of course, permit them to fail to respond to acts of moral infamy committed by extraterrestrial settlers. In conclusion, I would like to underscore the importance of an approach to religious questions, which no longer treats them either as merely cultural or psychological in opposition to the real, which would be exclusively disclosed by the physical sciences, nor alternatively within the circumscribed field of a single tradition explicitly or tacitly privileged. It is instead the operative perspective characteristic of the spirit worker, eclectic and pragmatic by nature, which allows us to reawaken the discipline of theology from its dogmatic slumber and will allow us to meet the challenges of frontiers we can scarcely even imagine. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ed, for that fantastic paper uh, and for giving us this great opportunity to think through our experience as humans going into space and the uh, considerations of how we may need to adjust, both adjust ourselves and uh, adjust with one another and to and with those whom we may encounter, whether spiritual or uh, of, of our own nature uh, in, in the cosmos. And with that, uh, I'd like to open it up for Q&A if you're comfortable with that. Uh, if folks would like to submit questions, please feel free to raise your hand using the Zoom function to, to ask them verbally. Uh, or if you're not comfortable with that, uh, please feel free to type it into the chat and I'll relay it myself. Um, and so perhaps to get us started with this, one thing that I would like to think about is perhaps a tension that I noticed, which is the sort of recentering of the human upon themselves, but also the necessity for the breakdown between internal and external and the, the seeming dissolution of a self upon which to center. Um, and so I'm very curious to, to hear if you could speak a little bit more about that and you're thinking about how that might function and how we might try to get at least some sense of it. Um, and then perhaps I'll think through, I'll raise um, an artist actually, who we at NSP DOS recently engaged with, um, who is trying to think about some of this and, and um, uh, we'll just pause at that for, for the audience then. But first I'd like to hear your thoughts about this. Sure. Um, I think that uh, in thinking about these issues, I was very aware of the necessity because I'm foregrounding the role of uh, the operator, mm -hmm. uh, the spirit worker. Uh, I was very aware of the necessity to not uh, step on the situational determinations that they will be equipped to make in the actual situation that they face. And that will be informed by their immediate participation in the situation, as well as by the gods and spirits that they're in communication with. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, it was necessary in order to establish some very general conditions to attempt to step into a, uh, an emptily formal mode of reflection, let's say, a type of, of metaphysical reflection upon what would be, it seems to me, the inevitable 
aspects of the calculations into which the people actually in these habitats would be making. And what struck me as being irreducible, given a basic orientation toward life, which I think is inherent in living beings, and which I think is a telos of spirituality, so to speak, as such, if we may speak in such general terms. It occurred to me that an irreducible circumstance of the situation was a change in the mode of enclosure or containment of the individual in a living space. When we are within the planetary matrix that uh, gave birth to us and our species, we're a living being within a living environment. It's somewhat akin to being a living being inside another living being. Uh, it's not for nothing that this is how the planetary matrix has been uh, so often conceived in, in primary traditions. Uh, now, in the kind of environments that we're talking about, as I say, it occurred to me that only at the extreme limits of the possibilities of such habitats could we consider them to be ecosystems in anything like the same sense. And so it seemed to me that for the effective future, one would need to instead consider that that outer layer of, uh, of uh, enclosure or containment did not exist. All right, so then what do we have? What we have is we have the scene, so to speak, of life shifting entirely to that within the embodied individual. And the consequences of this then first, uh, a relative inversion of the positions of interior and exterior, as I attempted to sketch. And secondly, uh, the radical pluralization of the experience within the individual, uh, which, which goes along with this in the sense that uh, the, uh, the individual, the, the, the atomized individual, so to speak, um, being a reflection of the containment environment to begin with uh, has to shift. And therefore we have not only this reversal of orientation from exterior to interior, but also a coming within, so to speak, of all of the kind of multiplicity of the world, mm -hmm. which we experience as external objects when we're living within this envelope or, or, or planetary matrix. Great, great, thank you. And that, so when we had first spoken about your participating in this, one subject that we had talked about and which I think you, you sort of addressed, but I wanna uh, perhaps explicate is the uh, notion of say shrines or temples to various spirits or gods. And so my, if I'm understanding what you're proposing, it's that there may be due to the change in the environment and the way from, and moving away from earth per se, um, a need to spiritually uh, move the notion of a shrine or a temple internal to the physically embodied spirit worker in this case. Uh, and that sort of rehousing of that architectural structure within the embodied human in this case, or perhaps not human in the future, but spirit worker. Um, and that reorients their engagement with the world such that they have to be radically open in order to serve that function. Is that, would that be a fair way to characterize what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, when we first uh, when we first discussed my participation in in this panel, I was initially uh, thinking, and also given the architectural uh, focus uh, 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 of the event, 
I was initially thinking a lot about shrines and about dedicated religious structures. But then what gradually occurred to me was that given the basic existential conditions of these environments, that spirituality was not going to be able to be contained within foci like that. It was going to spill out into everything. And uh, the spirit worker in that context is going to have to be quite aware of that. There may very well be shrines that serve as foci for ritual activities, for the ritual life of the community. But the spirit worker is going to have to be very sensitive to the migration of individuals' uh, spiritual experience to invest whatever other aspects of their life they may be engaged in. And not least of which, because uh, if they're not attentive to this, the shifting field of action, so to speak, uh, they could fail to pick up on uh, um, a, a, a looming spiritual crisis mm. in an individual, mm. which could um, ultimately endanger them and endanger the community as a whole. Um, I, I think that the, the regularization, the normalization of life in such environments is going to be hard won. And it's going to come at the cost of a certain mutation of the, uh, of the community, a certain mutation of, of the social structure in directions that we can't necessarily uh, preconceive very well. Um, and so, while there will certainly be dedicated spaces for worship, the best analogy is to look back at the earliest stages of human civilization when we were confronting a similarly inimical environment, as I said, whether because of the innate features of that environment or because of, of the lack of, 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 of developed capacity in the human species. If you look back at those earliest uh, uh, spiritual organizations, what you see is that it, for a very long time, it doesn't seem like there's necessarily dedicated space. Um, I mean, our understanding of the antiquity of dedicated space for worship uh, is getting pushed back all the time. Finds like uh, Gobekli Tepe, for instance, show now that uh, such dedicated spaces, uh, to some degree, must even pre-exist uh, uh, institutions like agriculture, and certainly uh, pre-exist by a long way institutions like the state, um, upon which previous generations of theorists, let's remember, had almost universally thought them to be dependent in, in some way. Now it seems like the dependency goes the other way. So definitely, the existence of such dedicated spaces is going to be uh, is going to be important, but we have to recognize that in what I theorize as this kind of uh, discovery or encounter stage, uh, there's no uh, way to keep that experience confined within some particular room or structure. Uh, it's going to it's going to move around and it's going to it's going to flow in very unexpected ways. And um, this is why I emphasize the, the pragmatism and the eclecticism of spirit workers in these situations, because they are going to be, uh, they're going to be riding the tiger, so to speak. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and one, to, to return to my, uh, the last part of my initial comment before, before we got off on that, into that. Um, there's, I just want to put it out there for, for the group and for the audience, um, an artist named Adam Dybert, who spoke as a part of our Transceiver guest speaker series, and he has developed a new artistic practice that he calls space juggling, 
Um, and in this, he uses uh, his, he's a PhD in, in physics um, and has thought about what it would mean to practice kinetic, the kinetic arts uh, outside of Earth's gravity well. Um, and if we can't assume the sort of vertical axis, um, which seems uh, resonant, quite resonant with what you're thinking about and talking about. So uh, I posted a link to a recording of his talk for us uh, in the chat. So if folks are interested, it's also available on the New School Policy and Design for Outer Space YouTube channel, uh, if folks would like to take a look at that in the future. Um, and I don't wanna to Bogart <laughs> the whole Q&A period. So uh, if anyone else has any questions, please do feel free to either put them in the chat uh, or address them vocally uh, if you are comfortable with that. I can also keep going, but I want to make sure to, to open it up to others. Uh, just a brief comment in response to what you were saying about, uh, about the kinetic arts. Um, we should remember that um, uh, kinetic practices may be a major component of the methods of spirit workers, depending on the traditions that they come from. Many of these traditions assign a great deal of importance to dance, uh, to uh, 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 other kinds of, of kinetic engagement as a way of, of deploying the relationships, the, the spiritual relationships that uh, the particular spirit worker um, requires. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you for that reminder. Um, while folks are gathering their thoughts, I have another question for you, which is about the, uh, the ties of particular materials to the worship of gods as they are currently known, or spirits as they're currently known today. Um, or ones that are known today. Uh, and so if we think about particular materials that are associated with uh, a given spirit, um, let's think of, um, I think the pine cone is one that's associated with Dionysus, if I remember correctly. Um, there are probably not going to be pine cones <laughs> on other planets. Um, and so if we think about, um, folks who may continue to worship Dionysus into the future and off world, um, but whose traditions had or may still want to continue to require materials like that. How do we think about adjusting material worship practices to the lack of those specific materials or would it be impermissible to continue to practice those, those methods of worship? Would we need to think about what is only possible given access to certain certain materials. Oh, well, I, I certainly don't think that the latter would be the case. Okay. Um, all of these traditions have shown themselves to be extremely flexible over time. And certainly we see that when they're transported into diaspora settings, uh, as, as uh, so many traditions have been, either uh, uh, voluntarily or involuntarily, um, as in the case of the transportation of African traditional religions across the Atlantic due to the slave trade, what we see is that these traditions adapt to the local environment. Um, now, the early generations of practitioners can very well bring with them on their initial uh, voyage to the habitat, certain essentials for their practice. And many traditions already uh, embody a process of um, constituting one's gods and spirits in portable, uh, in portable habitats, um, such as uh, so-called spirit pods, for example, uh, where in the process of initiation, the devotee accumulates and constitutes the, uh, the synthetic uh, material ground uh, of the deity in question. Um, uh, 
And so in the early stages, this kind of procedure can bring these material fundaments, so to speak, into the extraterrestrial habitat from the planetary matrix. Now, over time, I think it's reasonable to expect that there will be an increasing investment, spiritual investment or cathexis, let's say, to borrow a term from psychoanalysis, of elements of the environment, um, both idiosyncratic elements of the individual's uh, life and daily activities, but also, uh, uh, also categorical investments, let's say, of uh, the elements of the environment with the proviso that in situations where direct contact, say, with the planetary environment uh, is impossible for humans, this has to change the relationship to the substances that they're going to come in contact with. The, I, I think that it's inevitable that uh, in a planetary habitat, for instance, um, tokens of the environment beyond the, the human habitation uh, will be extremely important spiritually to the inhabitants. But at the same time, the fact that they have to be taken out of the environment, which is natural to them, in order to become part of our environment, can't be ignored, and it can't. It it, it can only impact uh, the the type of spiritual investment that takes place. And so, it's not to say that that investment can't take place, but it's made more complex by that because it introduces an element of mediation. And so it's going to be different. Um, mm. In other cases, I mean, I, uh, uh, one can speak of a more direct sort of transposition. I mean, you bring up the worship of Dionysus and uh, key to the worship of Dionysus is, uh, is the experience of intoxication. And so although Dionysus has a, an intimate connection to certain traditional forms of intoxication uh, on earth, um, most notably the production of wine from grapes. Uh, nevertheless, an aspect of his uh, intoxicatory activity will adapt itself to whatever mode of intoxication is practiced by humans in such an environment. And I think we can say with some confidence that there will be intoxicants in such an environment, uh, even, if, even if there weren't uh, 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 transitory, um, transitory states of, uh, of, 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 of psychic euphoria would, uh, would take their place. Great, thank you. I uh, want to address the rest of the audience, everyone else in attendance again. Uh, please do feel free to engage yourself to ask any questions that you might have uh, or to type them into the chat. You can either verbally or uh, through the textual medium do that. And if you want to submit them textually, I will, I will read them uh, so that we get them reported. Uh, go ahead, Sands, please. Hey, Nick, thanks. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay this time. Um, yep, yep. Great. So uh, I just had a quick question. Um, I'm thinking about some of the early space walks and some of the kind of uh, awe experiences that, that happened. Um, a, a couple of points at which uh, some of the astronauts couldn't be convinced to come back in um, and had to, yeah, be over, over the comms, uh, actually. Uh, taken out of their kind of uh, mental state that, that the experience of floating above the earth put them in. And it was kind of almost like a detachment that they didn't want to come back in. Um, and I don't, I don't think this has been consistent across all of them, but that has happened. And it, it makes me think about uh, other 
terrestrial and uh, how uh, how important certain locations on landscapes uh, have been to certain rhythms. And so I was wondering if there was some reflection on uh, that, um, yeah, just that that state of awe that we might be put in and and how that might play out uh, either terrestrially or or, or, or non-internally. I guess I'm, I'm struggling to think that everything will go internal, uh, but I'm not an expert in this. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about, yeah, the, the, uh, the terrestrial context we might find ourselves in and how that might weave into this. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a great, that, that, that's a great question. And I, I, I think that the, um, the experiences that you speak of, uh, the, the, the incidents uh, to which you refer, I think uh, are, are uh, evocative of one of the kinds of problematics that I'm trying to wrestle with here. Because I think that there will be a very strong tendency or an, an impulse let's say, to experience, uh, for instance, going on a spacewalk, going outside of that, 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 that container, there will be a powerful impulse to experience that as being analogous to going outdoors on a planet that supports life. Uh, but of course, understandably, that is uh, something on the order of a false analogy because you're actually you're actually going out into an environment which while it superficially resembles that uh, that that void void space or apparent void space uh, as it were void space in which one's home, say, is contained. While it seems like that, you're really stepping out into a completely different kind of container. It's, it's, it's not at all a container in that same sense anymore. And I think that that is a powerful that, that's bound to be a powerful experience of reorientation. And that's one of the basic things that I'm working with here because I think it's one of the fundamental existential conditions of being in that environment is the, that, that fundamental change in the mode of containment because one is contained in an inimical space. Um, uh, uh, and no matter how harsh the environment on planet Earth, no matter how harsh the environment in which you, you would find yourself, I mean, the only analogy would be uh, 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 to be uh, under the sea, for instance, to, to step, you know, to step out into, into an environment like that. Um, but even there, um, one would still be in a matrix of life now, as I said, I think that from the spirit worker's perspective, there's life everywhere, but we don't have the alliances. We haven't made the alliances, or if we have, we don't know that we have with, with whatever constitutes life in those spaces. Even if you're under the sea, you're surrounded by life with whom we share a common origin and with which we have primordial alliances. And so even if you get yourself into a situation that turns out to be deadly for you, it's still different than getting into such a situation in the void of space or on a planet to which we don't belong. At least, that's my hypothesis. Great, thank you. And perhaps for those who may be unaware, could you uh, say a little bit about what you mean by alliance and what you're doing with that, that concept? 
Yeah, by alliance, I mean um, the relationships that are established um, between the human species and other living species on the planet Earth, the alliances which are formed by an individual in their embodied lifespan with, uh, with um, individuals of their own and of other species, and of the, uh, the collective spiritual embodiments of different species, as well as the relationship with permanently discarnate incorporeal beings, such as gods. Uh, all, of these, all of these relationships, these are alliances that are created by us or they're created before us and we're born into them. Uh, and we're born into them whether we have uh, any intact tradition for engaging with them or not. They're, they're part of the context and not having an intact tradition doesn't mean that they're not there. It just means that we're, we're lacking in protocols for, um, um, for uh, uh, operating within and operating with those alliances, those relationships. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions they'd, they'd like to ask? Ah, oh, yes, we've got one in the chat. Uh, so we have a message from Donna. Thank you, Donna. And I will relay this verbally. My signal keeps cutting out, so I'm not sure if this question is appropriate to talk, but riffing off the topic of space and worship, I was wondering if you've come across any findings on the relationship between spirituality and gravity thinking about how the idea of grounding and tethering is central to so many religions, how would the release from gravity evolve our understanding of worship? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. Um, that's another aspect of um, the position that I start from, which is that uh, one of the critical elements for survival that are initially lacking or extremely under supplied in extraterrestrial habitats is orientation. And part of that, of course, in extraplanetary environments will be gravitation. Um, however, I think that even in an environment supplied with gravitation, I think that we have to understand that the scientific notion of gravitation is very impoverished, uh, a very thin uh, notion, uh, a very thin way of conceiving or articulating an experience of uh, contact and rootedness, which is much wider as a phenomenon. Uh, it's much wider in scope. It's just that in the natural sciences, we deal with a very narrow aspect of that, which is relevant for the procedures and and the uh, uh, and the purposes of of the natural sciences and the the technologies that that uh, that are based upon them, and so I see it as a subset of the general problem of orientation that extends to other things, uh, the complete disruption of the day night cycle. Uh, the uh, uh, the change in relative orientation to every kind of celestial object. Um, uh, all of these, th th there is virtually no level on which the uh, experience of orientation doesn't have to fundamentally transform itself in these environments, uh, at least as a hurdle for even getting into them and even becoming a long-term participant in them. Now, down the line, of course, these orientations will cohere. And I think that what I'm discussing in my talk to some extent, at least for some such environments, will be the description of a kind of a bottleneck that, uh, uh, that people will have to pass through until they're in a position to have more robust systems of orientation that have been established for generations uh, and, and provide people uh, um, a, a more robust space for, uh, 
for let's say uh, for actually a more secular experience it's it's almost like a more secular experience w would only gradually become possible um, as the level of direct existential threat actually the, the 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 degree of direct mortal imperilment actually diminishes i think great thank you and thank you donna for submitting that question if anyone else has questions, please feel free to verbally address them or type them in the chat as Donna did. Um, and while folks are gathering their thoughts, one question at the very beginning of your talk, you articulated the idea that the current optimal way of engaging in the world or what's understood as the optimal way of engaging in the world is a sort of atheistic uh mode of engagement and that going into space would actually overcome this and so i'm curious if you could say a little bit about what you think are the conditions that promote that atheistic engagement with the world and what more specifically will change uh from from the conditions as they currently exist to going into space if you could just explicate that a little bit uh well i think that the present state of affairs uh, it represents uh, a, a kind of uh, a social equilibrium, uh, uh, for lack of a better term. Um, and my hypothesis is that because we're actually finding this state of equilibrium to be less and less sustainable, that the relevant cultural changes and intellectual changes are going to occur here, um, regardless, frankly, of, of uh, the degree to which we explore space. Uh, however, to the degree that we do explore space, it that experience because that will be the kind of uh frontier of, of what i call the kind of encounter or discovery uh, uh um phase of religious experience uh will naturally become something of a focal point potentially even for those who don't go into space themselves um there may indeed be a feedback effect uh if 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 there's if the exploration of space and the inhabitation of extraterrestrial habitats becomes a sufficiently important part of the human experience then that's going to be that's going to be a spiritual leading edge as well and uh that's going to impact that's that's going to have resonance um down here, so to speak. But uh, the changes that I envision, I feel uh, would be taking place even if that doesn't occur uh, for technological reasons or for uh, for whatever kinds of reasons. If, if that doesn't materialize, I still think that the kind of basic equilibrium and the sort of default the sort of default position of uh, a healthy, well-adjusted human being, I think is, is inevitably going to change anyway uh, in, the, in, in the years to come. I see that as being more or less unavoidable just because of the kind of intensity of, of the stresses uh, that we're under and and the magnitude of the forces which are clashing. Got it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and I mean, I've got a number of other questions, but I want to be sensitive to to your time and to the possibility that others want to speak. Uh, so perhaps we will give it a moment if there's anybody else who has any other questions um, or comments that they want to get on the table you are invited to do so. Um, but if not, then Ed, if you have any final thoughts or anything that you want to put on the table, perhaps for us to consider, um, then we would certainly welcome that and would appreciate, we appreciate that. 
Go ahead, Sam. I was just curious here a little bit more. I was fascinated by this. Um, I had never thought about the perspective uh, on gravity as being impoverished, but it's very fascinating to me. Um, and maybe that's just for a lack of, of kind of digging in, in those fields on my part. Um, but if you had a little bit more to say on um, that impoverishment uh, and, and what you see as uh, lying inside of, of the purview of science, or, or maybe not outside of the purview of science, but just ways in which science doesn't engage, uh, that there's a broader story out there. Well, uh, it, to some extent, it's as simple as the gulf between uh, the scientific account of gravitation and the phenomenological account of the lived experience of being in a body with weight uh, um, uh, in a planetary matrix on the surface of a world. Um, it, the 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 account purely in terms of physics say of any lived experience uh phenomenologically articulated is going to be impoverished it's, it's going to be very it's going to be very narrow because it's essentially just the explication of uh uh, uh, uh a very small part of of a completely uh, um, reciprocally, theoretically determined field. Uh, and so um, gravitation as part of the total discourse of physics um, is only a very, uh, of only a very narrow slice. Um, whereas uh, it, it interfaces, let's say, with our lived experience through the mediation of those uh, discursive practices, the discursive practices associated with, for instance, you know, uh, theoretical physics. Um, but that's, of course, within a much wider context for us of lived experience that is primordial. We have a primordial lived experience of being in a body with weight. Um, being in a body which has a position uh, within a, a domain of physical objects that all have specific weight, extension, inherent force. Uh, so that's what I mean when I speak of the impoverishment of, of the concept of gravitation. There's, there's simply much more to what is uh, being theorized uh, by that account uh, then can be contained within the account of physics. Great, thank you. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, Sands, we, you were breaking up there, but I, I think that was a, a thank you as well. <laughs> um, does anyone else have anything that they want to get on the table? Otherwise, Ed, any final thoughts, any comments or questions for us that you'd like for us to, to take away today? Uh, well, you know, it doesn't necessarily surprise me if people don't exactly know how to, how to engage with these ideas at first blush, because I recognize that I, uh, I'm, I'm, pushing these considerations very far in the direction, as far as I can, in the direction of certain fundamental metaphysical and existential considerations. And then when you factor in that there's also a very unfamiliar conception of religion and of theology that I'm deploying in this discussion, people who aren't familiar with the kind of theoretical perspective that I'm coming from, it's not surprising to me that it would be a little bit uh, difficult to to formulate a response, uh, uh, at least at least immediately. Um, but what I would, uh, I guess, uh, what I would suggest to people to take away from this uh, is, as I said at the end, um, 
a fundamental shift that I'm operating in how we conceive of the uh, subjective and objective experience of religion. Uh, the, the fundamental characterization of the activity as being one of relations, uh, relations with objects of religious regard who are in uh, most cases incorporeal entities. Um, this fundamentally relational character and fundamentally operational character or empirical character of uh, religious experience, um, what was theorized by the ancient Platonists as theurgy, God working, working with gods, uh, working upon these relationships, these alliances of all these different kinds. Um, this is the fundamental paradigm shift. And my argument in essence is that the extremity of the extraterrestrial habitat uh, is only going to be successfully addressed without um, ultimately unsustainable cost for the kinds of beings that we are uh, through this kind of emergent understanding or the um, reoccupation of the position in which uh, we uh, primordially possessed these understandings. Uh, that that, that uh, kind of paradigm shift is going to be required by the demands of that environment. And that was the way in which I felt that it was necessary to approach um, the problem of worship in these environments if I was going to really take, uh, try and take seriously um, uh, just exactly how much is involved, the, just the human cost of inhabiting them, I felt uh, really uh, required this degree of radical questioning. Great, thank you. And thank you for thank you for taking that step to go so far to think through it in that way. This has been a hugely thought provoking and delightful conversation and talk. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you to everyone who attended and thank you again to City X and the Venice Architecture Biennale for uh, hosting this perennial activity series. We will meet again tomorrow at 12 GMT minus five uh, to hear from uh, Exomon Studios who are thinking about the subject of having sex in space and how that may, how that may continue <laughs> in the future. So uh, please, please come out and attend that and the rest of the series uh, if you can this week. Uh, and thank you again, Ed, for speaking with us today.